So Marina, I, I kind of want to bring you back in to kind of tie it all together in a sense, because you mentioned at Schroeder's you have a 3D framework. So deglobalization, decarbonization, and demographics. Would you mind kind of maybe explaining a little bit more of that framework and how you're using that to make investment decisions? Yeah, so we talked about it in the context of inflation, right, that those 3Ds are kind of inflationary by nature. But overall, I think it's just the way we kind of frame and understand like what investments really should look like in the coming decades. It's kind of the opposite of what we did before because it is a lot of things in reverse. Um, so as I said, kind of the decarbonization piece is this long-term trend towards setting net zero targets and delivering them both at the sovereign and the corporate level. Um, the deglobalization or, or, you know, kind of um, undoing again, kind of decades of, of globalization is about reshoring supply chains and, and the decoupling of the East and the West. And then um, the, the demographics is certainly, we, we're gonna have by 2030, I think 85 million jobs unfilled, um, population growth moving in reverse by 28 or 29. I mean, it, and you know, post pandemic, I think people's perception of work, how they want to work, whether they wanna work is very different. And so there's that piece of it. Um, and then just, you know, obviously in kind of the developed world, shrinking populations. So we use all of that, our investors use all of that to kind of frame out. It's really about both kind of um, avoiding risk and also capturing opportunity. And by the way, all of this is done with also active ownership and engagement with companies. So it's not sort of in a vacuum. We are active owners. 100% of what we do is active management. Um, and so we are working with companies to try to deliver solutions to some of these issues. But certainly we're doing climate risk assessment in every portfolio on every investment we take. We're looking at physical risk. We're looking at stranded asset risk because you do have assets that in approximate sense are going to be stranded before the end of their useful lives, some of which are currently being invested in, which is a problem. Um, we have also kind of companies as climate laggards, um, and this is in terms of setting decarbonization or a transition agendas and actually delivering on them. And so it's things like cost. Um, are they going to bear a much higher carbon price in the future? It's things like risk of litigation, regulation, legislation, um, and, and you know, policy. And it's also things like network effects. If you're in a supply chain of a large company that makes a commitment and has to deliver that commitment and you're not playing ball, you're not gonna be in that supply chain much longer. And so there's a bit of a kind of a peer pressure element to it. And then, um, I mean, I'd rather talk about the opportunity than the risk, right? There's the climate leaders, there's the transition enablers, there's obviously innovation and scaling up these new technologies around um, uh, energy. As I said, minerals and rare earths, we do look at commodities as potentially a valuable hedge in this environment. Then on the deglobalization piece, there's both the companies and the countries that benefit from the reorienting of supply chains. So on one hand, you have kind of emerging markets that can attract manufacturing away from China, so India in the pole position, but also Vietnam, South Korea, and others. And then in terms of developed markets, um, the US is on the list, but also kind of Germany and other places in terms of smart manufacturing, and obviously technologies like AI, um, robotics. Um, and then probably my favorite piece, which is on the demographics, um, we've done some really key work this year on human capital ROI. You don't just have to flail around. I mean, you actually can measure um, sort of the benefits, right, of what you spend on your people being your greatest asset, frankly, for most companies, which have a lot of intangible value. And so we're looking at those companies who has the best sort of human capital management practices and return on investment on that, that of effort. And so those are the companies that are gonna have lower productivity, excuse me, higher productivity, lower turnover, right? All the things that we're kind of looking for there. And as you said, productivity boosting technology as well. Um, and also on the demographics, I think it was mentioned, you know, briefly, but kind of healthcare. There's a huge kind of components there as well in terms of how you take care of an aging population. So it just gives, I think, investors a lot um, to kind of choose from. And these really are kind of enduring things because it's very hard next to impossible, I would say, to turn some of these things around, certainly something like demographics. And actually, I think, you know, the, the decarbonization isn't, isn't in reverse either. Um, so, so we just have to learn how to live with it.